In this series of videos, we're going to start trying to characterize how forces may cause things to rotate. You may remember back when we were first looking at our models of motion, um, both for kinematics and for dynamics, I had made the observation that for a rigid object, you can completely describe its motion as a combination of the translation of its center of mass combined with its rotation about its center of mass. To date, we've only been looking at the translation side of things, and now we need to start to segue over into thinking about rotations in order to get a complete description. So that end, we're going to build a uh, somewhat intuitive definition of torque um, to start to describe how we can attempt to rotate things. So what I have here is I have a force being applied at some point on something. Taken very broadly, you can think of any force being applied on anything as attempting to rotate it about whatever axis you may care about, which may or may not be the one it actually is spinning around, but usually will be the one that we care about. Um, so how could we characterize how this force is trying to spin something around this axis? Um, you can think about this by, say, going over to a door and just pushing on it. Um, think about how you could be more or less effective at doing that. One way that you could be more effective at pushing a door open is, say, if you push it farther away from the hinge. Um, if you try pushing it right next to the hinge, it's very hard to open the door. If you push it farther away from the hinge, it's um, easier to open the door. Okay. Also kind of goes without saying, if you just plain push harder, regardless of where it is you're pushing, it will be easier to open the door. But angle matters too. If you were to take the edge of your door, you know, um, if you push straight in toward the hinges, no matter how hard you push, you won't be able to make it uh, twist at all. Whereas if you push on a line perpendicular to the line that connects the hinges to the, uh, to the edge of the door, so if you push you know, square t tangent to the door, um, it's much easier to twist the door open. So these are the things we need to keep in mind when trying to come up with such a definition. And what physicists have settled on is they say, well, okay, we need to define one other thing here. Um, we're gonna draw a line that passes through the point of application. And it is a line, a geometric line that extends as far as you need. Um, we call this line the line of action for the force. Which is just saying the, the, the force is being directed along this line through this point. Okay. Now to characterize the, you know, we've already handled the how hard by just the force itself. But the issues of angle and how far away can both be resolved by dropping a perpendicular from the axis of rotation down to the, the line of action, wherever that may end up being. The, so this is the shortest possible distance from the axis to the line of action. We usually write that as R perpendicular, and this gets the name of um, usually lever arm or moment arm. I'll probably end up using them both uh, interchangeably. So with that, we're now, we can now go ahead and make a definition of torque the torque on something, this is a lowercase Greek letter tau. So if we think back to our 
the paper that we used in third grade or whatever. Oops, you would draw one kind of like that. Okay, so our torque is defined to be our perpendicular times the force. Um, there's a couple other things we have to keep straight. Um, that has one of them is the sign. Uh, we will say unless you specify otherwise, a torque is positive if the force is attempting to twist the thing counterclockwise. This does not mean that the thing is actually rotating counterclockwise or even rotating at all. We're just saying this particular force is trying to twist the thing counterclockwise. The torque due to that force would be positive. And similarly, negative would be if we were twisting it or attempting to twist it clockwise. Now that may seem the, to be the opposite of the way you would think. Um, but this has to do with the direction in which the Earth rotates. If you look down from above the Earth's north pole, um, the Earth rotates counterclockwise. The way I remember that is I think of the wedge that the nation of Brazil makes pointing into the Atlantic Ocean as an arrowhead that means spin this way. Anyway, this if you look down from on top of something rotating counterclockwise, if you flip the perspective and you look up, then that means it looks like the sun is rotating around the earth clockwise. And so in the northern hemisphere, the shadow of the sun on a sundial would move around clockwise. And so clock hands were made to go clockwise in order to maintain back compatibility with sundials. Um, so we so but because usually physicists if they care about this at all they care about the earth rotating we end up matching our signs with how the earth rotates of course you're free to define it otherwise but if you do you'll need to specify it because a physicist will assume a positive torque means you're trying to twist counterclockwise and negative one means you're trying to twist it clockwise. So also with units. The unit of torque is the Newton meter and this is not a joule. Um, the deal here is, and physicists will always write Newton meter um, for a torque in SI units and I'll write joules for an energy in SI units. And this is because remember work was describing the effect of a force being applied through a distance. Here with torque we're trying to describe the effect of a torque being of, of a um, force being applied at a distance trying to rotate something. The distinction between at and through is crucial and so we are very careful to write our units differently so that we can keep straight whether we're doing at or through. Okay, now there are other ways that we could go ahead and write this torque. One way we could do it is if we let this angle here be phi, if I go ahead and put my force vector and my position vector together tail to tail, like so, you should be able to convince yourself that this angle is also phi. Um, and that uh, um, yeah and then the r perpendicular um, so this bit right here 
um, would be my, whoops, I gotta get the right color here. Where's the purple? There's the purple. So this bit right here would be my R perpendicular. This angle would also be phi. So R per perpendicular would be R sine phi. So we could also write this as R F sine phi. So if you're totally in doubt, if you can at least write, draw a position vector and a force vector, just go put them tail to tail. It'll be R F sine phi. Now, instead of multiplying the sine phi by the R, we could just as freely multiply it by the F, and what would that look like? Well, for instance here, let's say we're thinking about trying to use a wrench to loosen a stubborn bolt or something like that. So, or here's my nut anyway, that I'm trying to loosen. Um, there's my wrench. Yeah, well, I tried. Um, there's the little hole you hang your wrench with. Um, if I go ahead and apply a force at some arbitrary um, angle here, um, say like so, the bit of the force that's directed inward isn't going to do anything for churning us. The bit of the force that is tangent, so FT here, this FT turns out to be F sine phi. Um, this would be my R here for completeness sake. Feel free to play with it, and you should be able to convince yourself that uh, this tangential component of the force is, is equal to F sine phi. So we could also write our torque um, equally usefully as F tangential time, sorry, R without a perpendicular times F tangential. So sometimes it'll be easier to think about just the straight distance here to here, and then think about the bit of the force that's tangential right at that point, rather than finding R perpendicular. So either you find R perpendicular and use all of F, or you find, use R and you find F tangential, or you can just keep R and F as long as you find the angle. These are the three ways that you can write a torque. So you might ask yourself, what if I have some object that's being acted on by more than one force? All right, so let's take a look at that. Let's say you got some blob. Now oh, it looks like that or something. And it's mounted onto an axle here. Now, let's just say we got a bunch of random forces acting on it at different points in random directions. Maybe something like that. And in general, if you were to add up these forces, they probably wouldn't add up to zero. Maybe let's say in this case they add up mostly downward. Um, in that case, the axle itself would be exerting a force on the thine to keep it put. Now, what would be the torque due to this axle force about the axle? Pause and think about this for a second, and then we'll get back. Okay, so the torque due to the axle do this, the force exerted by the axle is zero. And the way you can see this is the axle is my axis of rotation. I've got my force being applied right there, which means my line of action passes right through the axle. So the shortest distance between the line of action and the axis, our perpendicular, is zero. So the torque for the force due to the axle 
will be equal to r perpendicular times the force of the axle. And r perpendicular is zero, so the torque is zero. So this is a handy fact to keep in the back of your pocket that um, if you're concerned about finding the torque about some axle, you don't have to worry about the force that the axle itself exerts on the thing to find the torque. You will have to worry about it on the forces side. Well, anyway, the way this definition is constructed, you can say that the net effect of all these other forces on the thigh, including the torque due to the axle, which is zero, um, the net torque on the thigh will be equal to the torque due to force one plus the torque due to force two plus the torque due to force three plus the torque due to force four, and just keep going for however many um, forces you have. Now you might ask yourself, okay, what if one of those forces is gravity? Um, here, all I can do is quote a result. So let's say you got a blob that looks, I don't know, like that or something. And this is my axis of rotation right here. Um, so I got, an, let, let's say I got an axle mounted right there. So we're guaranteeing that this is where it's pivoting. And I'll also make that my axis of rotation so I can calculate the torque about it. Um, in the not too distant future, we will be defining how to locate the center of mass of a thine. For now, we'll just satisfy ourselves with saying, it's the point that if you, no matter how you try to balance it, if you balance it there, um, well, it'll always balance about that point, no matter how you mount your fulcrum. Um, so let's say this point right here is the center of mass. Um, what you do, and this is this can only be proven using the methods of calculus, so it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but the result is useful. What you do is you pretend that the force of gravity of the entire thine is being applied at the center of mass. And if you do that, you will get the correct answer for the torque every time. You do not need to break this up into pieces. Um, the, 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 the result takes care of that automatically. So yes, the bits here to the left of the axle are trying to twist the thing counterclockwise. The bits to the right of the axle are trying to twist it clockwise, but that's automatically baked into the cake by, the, by locating the center of mass here. Now, for symmetric objects, the center of mass of the thing will usually end up being the symmetry center. Um, so it's often very straightforward to figure out where the center of mass is, but we will define it more rigorously later. Okay, so in the next video we will apply this to what's called static equilibrium situations, which is where we can look at the fact that something is not rotating to figure out more about it. Catch you in the next one.